Go ahead. Welcome to Scramble Game Show. This is a first production of the Labor Day, and I hope you had all had a very good summer and this long weekend. Uh, personally, I took a trip to China for a month. I just got back and still was a little bit jet lag, but the trip was very interesting. Uh, I sort of visit China every other year. Uh, two years makes big difference, and you see the differences in uh, not just the sort of a, uh, infrastructure, hardware, but as well as software. The software nowadays people actually pay attention to, uh, probably in a good word really, is, is cultural aspect of uh, changes. Now, today we have a guest. Uh, we invited this guest for this show because uh, now in the news we have heard so much about uh, China and we heard so much about the current events that are sort of uh, uh, hyping up the confrontational sort of positioning uh, between the United States and China. Uh, as a Chinese American or American Chinese, however you want to call it, I always feel that this type of hype is really not necessary and is unfounded. And I happen to be uh, knowing uh, some people and uh, sort of uh, through internet communication that uh, shared with many people the same view. We feel that the U.S.-China relationship is not really a hostile relationship. In fact, maybe later on when I interview our guest, we'll talk a little about, about it and uh, how I feel it. But today, our guest comes from uh, California, a long way, and his name is Mr. Richard Chen, and I will do a little more introduction as we welcome him. Richard, welcome Thank you, to Dr. our show. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Let me first tell you a little bit about our show, then I will get into sure, sure. and talk about your background and get to uh, our session. Okay. This Scramble Game Show, you may find it's a sort of a, a strange. What kind of name is that for talking about somewhat you know, international world uh, affairs? The Scramble Game Show is a community uh, educational show. Okay. We start out with <clears throat> showing people uh, word games, math games. Our audience is the community, families, schools, teachers, and so on. And, and it was many years, actually. This, we are now 10th year in this program. Um, the educational aspect certainly is very worthwhile you know, goal. And then we get into interview with educators, and then politicians, <laughs> then business people, executives, so on. So uh, all under the umbrella is for education. And I think we're doing a, a very good service to the community and to our audience, particularly um, families, because I feel that uh, although we have good school systems and, um, you know, but Nowadays, the knowledge, the information flow is so rapid, yes. it's just unbelievable. So we do need to have this augmented you know, sort of a, a view, particularly a view you bring experts in, okay, and in a short time give you a dosage that more than you can learn in a classroom. Right? Right. So that's how this show sort of evolved. And we uh, um, interviewed uh, the politicians are very easy to get because locally, every <laughs> two years you have election and yes. then every other year you have <clears throat> candidates. So we interview all the way from, uh, you know, supervisor, town, mayor, and, uh, you know, assemblyman and senator and so on and so forth. So um, we have lots of those interviews. And occasionally, though, we do invite people from fairly far. And you from California is fairly far. And recently we had somebody from Virginia uh, who is uh, uh, a very um, a unique person in a way that um, she brought an ancient map 
to show us uh, the map was inherited from her parents, uh, her father, who was a missionary uh, in China. Mm. And the ancient map in, uh, in China actually uh, showed uh, the maritime sort of uh, routes and, and uh, places so on, S relates back to uh, what was 1840, some very old, mm. right? And, <clears throat> With some information plus other things, there's now a theory about uh, China or the Chinese people are the first people actually discover America, mm. okay, and, and not Columbus. Obviously, that's a very exciting thing if, you know, it's true. And we interviewed her and we showed this, this and so on, and, and, you know, through the other interaction, it turns out there are many books written about this, and it certainly is lots of evidence showing that, not only from uh, uh, the uh, historical maps, but also from the, the uh, ships uh, and uh, anchors that now uh, discovered in the California coast, mm -hmm. huge anchors for the Ming Dynasty boats. And <clears throat> on top of that, many artifacts that discovered in the United States, you know, artifacts that are uh, dated back, you know, thousands of years and so on. Then, the top scientific evidence is DNA. Mm. And DNA studies about um, the American Indians um, in one tribe, Hopis or one tribe, there's a, there's a strand of DNA evidence to, sh to link with people from Honan province in China. Mm. That's the only link they have. Mm -hmm. So all of this shows that the, the, the Asian uh, had been in the United States or in America uh, long before. So that's very interesting. And I <laughs> I've had a privilege to interview this person mm. and being first. Uh, I you know, sort of uh, enjoyed this work because uh, we're doing really a, a service to the community. And today, you're here for the same purpose. Now I'm going to tell our audience a little bit about you. Uh, Mr. Chen uh, has been uh, known as a political uh, analyst now, but in the past, uh, he was sort of accidentally stumbled into uh, politics in some way, uh, mainly because the most uh, sort of in important event is when Mr. Deng Xiaoping, uh, as many of you, I hope, I mean, you heard of it. <laughs> uh, the uh, Chinese leader came in the 70s. Mr. Chen was the interpreter for him. Uh, that got him really involved in, in uh, sort of a high level uh, political figures and involved the interest in politics. And before that, of course, he was actually trained uh, as engineering, and then worked for several companies. And the main company that he worked for uh, is um, uh, Occidental Petroleum, uh, which, of course, as you know, it's a global company, has many uh, interests uh, in, the, in the world. And he was the vice president for the Asian affairs uh, for the company. Um, before that, he did work for IBM, Western Electric, uh, sort of hopefully utilize your engineering training <laughs> to some degree, okay? So that's Mr. Chen's background, and uh, through his uh, interpretation work and later on interest in the, in the politics, he's been interviewed by others as well. Uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have him happen to be able to be here from California. Uh, we're going to talk about the world's affair the uh, U.S., China, Japan <clears throat> relationship in general, okay? Uh, we'll let the time flow, and hopefully you will enjoy and you will hear what he has to say and what's happening currently in the world. Okay, Richard. Now. Well, thank you, Yifei. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. And uh, uh, in the old days, uh, I know that uh, the, this area is very close to the... Uh, IBM activity. And, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Being an IBMer for over 12 years, uh, it's so, sort of like a 
Homecoming. Homecoming. Huh? Homecoming. And uh, I know Armand uh, headquarters right. is nearby, Yorktown yeah. Heights, the research yes. the community, Fishkill, right. Poughkeepsie for manufacturing. Oh, yeah. You're in IBM and, uh, the territory, so all right. <laughs> I know this area is the uh, uh, IBMers uh, uh, concentration, right. the highest. So here I know that the community, the members may have uh, direct uh, relations or relatives mm -hmm. uh, that is associated with IBM. So I'd like to say hello to the IBMers. Great, great. Um, we, I'm sure <coughs> I have IBMers. <laughs> yeah, as uh, right. Dr. Zhang mentioned, that uh, this program is uh, all about the education and uh, bring uh, the knowledge of the world uh, to the interested people in the community. Right. So being uh, <coughs> Going to China for the past uh, 40 years, uh, I know a little bit mm -hmm. about China, and uh, I would love to share with you some of my uh, readings and uh, my experience uh, in that particular Good. corner of Good. the world. Yeah, uh, you, you, you really um, bring this whole thing in focus now. Uh, recently, there are so many people writing essays about China. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some positive, some negative, some yeah. are futuristic, right? right. Uh, of course, positive part mainly is China is rising. That's no question yeah. about it. And the negative part is, you know, sort of in contrast whether China is a threat to yes. the Western world, particularly um, United States. Right. The futuristic part is all over the map. Correct. Right? Um, what I think maybe today we could start from that is f we will get to there, but we go backwards because I think history is always uh, the base for anything that happening in the future. Yes. And suddenly present <clears throat> depends on history. So I would like you to start, you know, thinking about this. U.S.-China relationship, at least we have a good hundred years. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. History. And let's, let's retrace that a little bit for our audience, particularly if young people are watching this one. Right. Okay? I think they ought to learn because sometimes uh, they are more focused on just American history. I mean, although American history is only a few hundred years, China is longer. But the important part is the part of the relationship between China and the United States? Yeah, I think the American people are uh, very versed in the uh, history of uh, Europe mm -hmm. and uh, have the history of your own, mm -hmm. of our own, uh, the American history. Mm -hmm. So it's like 250 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the uh, historical uh, understanding of the American people. So they are very mm -hmm. uh, well uh, versed in this area. However, in the uh, Asian area or African area, there are much less knowledge and uh, understanding. Right. And I think that, however, because of the uh, rapid rising of China mm. and its uh, economic development, mm. uh, being that China now is the number two economy in the world, mm -hmm. so of course, uh, as a Chinese American, uh, we are very happy that Chinese people, because of the uh, rapid and successful economic development, have improved their livelihood. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, however, uh, such uh, growth uh, in the economy of China uh, also brings certain uh, worry uh, from the outside world mm -hmm. because they felt that maybe uh, the Chinese is making everything become the factory of the world and take away our jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, our trade relation is uh, imbalanced. Mm -hmm. And we are buying more from China. We are mm -hmm. selling less to China. Mm -hmm. So there is a trade imbalance. So these are the areas <clears throat> that cause us to concern, mm -hmm. not just for the Americans, but for Europe and other countries as well. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, from another way of looking at it is uh, if the China is uh, developed so rapidly in economy, uh, are they going to uh, also develop 
Likewise, there are military strengths. Mm -hmm. And by developing such military strengths, would China become a threat mm -hmm. uh, to the world peace? Right. This is the part I sort of I wanted uh, to start off from a historical perspective. As you know, China, uh, 100, 120 years ago, is already a large country, but it's the weakest, the largest country Correct. in the world. Yes. And that was you know, a, a tragedy in their history in the sense that uh, uh, the Western countries, uh, you know, eight Western countries invaded China, partitioned uh, yeah. the coastline, occupied ports, and so on and so forth. It, it almost unthinkable as a nation to the, today, you know, that a country would be in that kind of a sort of status, right? And that's how China actually was, you know, that you know, 120 years ago. From that to today, uh, although it's hundred some years, but it's drastic change. And through this change, historically, I think the United States uh, has been with China in a, in a uh, uh, sometimes I kiddingly say, um, you know, it, it's like a, a, a marriage that goes through different phases, okay? Um, during Second World War, for example, uh, China and U.S. were allies and worked cl very closely. Uh, the military that saved each other's lives and battles and so on and so forth. There's so many stories that you actually uh, could <clears throat> read about it. And it, you might call that it's really a sort of love stories. Right. But on the other hand, after the Second World War, uh, it's sort of like a by, uh, like a arranged marriage, so to speak, created to China. Yeah. Right? It's a yes. totally artificially arranged, right? Um, it, it's not by any <laughs> other courtship, anything designed. So that position, it put the United States, okay, uh, sort of in a track, somehow become rigid. Mm. But yet today, even I think today, uh, some people, scholars, you know, talking about, is that really a right track? Whether China should, I mean, U.S. should uh, insist on, you know, certain, you know, China sort of a uh, uh, track or a position. So what do you think about that? Well, I'm glad that you brought this uh, topics up because uh, recently a uh, Orville Schill, a yeah. professor in uh, Berkeley, Orville Schill, yeah. And sure. uh, he uh, wrote an article which is uh, somewhat uh, critical of China's uh, present uh, uh, economic policy and the handling of the world's affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, his point is that, yes, China becomes stronger Mm -hmm. become uh, uh, more powerful, mm -hmm. uh, and the world has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, but he feels that uh, the uh, history Chinese is emphasizing mm -hmm. is to say we are, have been oppressed by the Western power for the past hundred years. Yeah. And uh, the Which next is a fact, of course, yeah. yeah and uh, uh, however, you know, China becomes stronger and uh, it's been that way for almost uh, 30, 40 years now. Mm. And uh, while world has changed, China has changed, should the China's look of her past history mm. uh, be modified, mm. uh, should be changed. Mm. And in other words, uh, don't teach your people to hate the foreigners. Mm. He feel that the Chinese is using the <laughs> humiliating history uh, uh, to stir up the hatred. I see. Uh, well, I, I think actually my personal piece, uh, experience to, you know, in visiting China, I think the Chinese people love Americans to the point is sometimes I feel illogical. Yeah, I, I give you an example. I give you an example. <laughs> I volunteer to teach English. Yeah. When I was in China, right. because one of my nephew does cultural exchange work, mm. and I help her out, and I, I said, well, I want to see how, what you do, and I volunteered. And turns out there are many people, of course, young people going to, to be assigned as teachers or everywhere. And I personally felt sort of actually jealous 
that if you are blonde, blue eyes, okay, not, not necessarily even blonde, any hair, just you're, you're American, you are you know, loved everywhere, welcomed everywhere, doesn't matter whether your English is perfect or whether your knowledge is <laughs> deeper, whether you, you know, have a, a, a historical sort of a yeah, understanding yeah. or culturally enriched, <clears throat> doesn't matter. They just love Americans. Yes. So, so I don't think the, the teaching part of history, I, I don't think they really hate them, you know, the, the no, foreigners. No, not uh, for the uh, general public. Hmm. Uh, what he's being critical is saying the the government's handle mm -hmm. of the history. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I understand. I, I see that uh, article. I think that he's saying that the government sometimes manipulate opinions, right, right. which is probably true everywhere in yeah, every country. Yeah. I mean, our government probably manipulates uh, media as well, sometimes yeah. the other way around, whatever. Uh, I don't think it's always true. In fact, no. I think it's somebody else wrote the article, I don't know, I remember recently, pointed out that the demonstrations, the media, and outbursts of uh, people's reaction towards current event recently has become more genuine than 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Sure, okay? yes. Um, in the past, un under a sort of a real uh, communist rule, as this is another topic, the communism in China has changed. I don't even recognize that <laughs> at this point, yeah. right? Uh, in the past, the government may be totally, you know, in the hand of sort of a, uh, controlling the demonstration and making a point and so forth. But today, they might be actually more concerned. The, these are genuine, you know, feelings, the genuine people's desire. In fact, when everybody is talking about, you know, American dream, Chinese dream, the Chinese people now want to have a real say in what is Chinese dream. True, okay. true. Right? I agree. I yeah. think that the, the uh, people said, uh, you know, uh, what is Chinese dream? Mm -hmm. What is a, a China dream? Yeah. And uh, I uh, made the point, I uh, said, well, China dream is every 1.3 billion Chinese dream. Yeah. And if the majority or overwhelming mm -hmm. dreamed in that direction, mm -hmm. that should be the, the, yeah. the, the true dream of China. In this part, I, I really, I think I agree when, uh, you know, Obama and um, uh, Mr. Xi met in California. Uh, I think when, when Mr. Xi referring to this Chinese dream, that mm. he's really thinking that basically China just want to raise the standard of living. True. I think he's telling the truth because yeah. when I meet people in China, they that is their, their dream. Their, their, right, right. Right. Their dream is not to dominate the world or invade somebody or or start a war. Right. True. So I think sometimes uh, when I read different articles, uh, some pieces, I feel uh, they are not really objective in a sense that uh, it somehow has a, a bias that try to create this confrontation in an artificial way. That's why I'm trying to make this G2 relationship as like a marriage. Yeah. I mean, when you are in a marriage, <clears throat> uh, if you do not honor the commitments, the agreements, uh, the uh, uh, whatever uh, Potsdam <laughs> agreement or San Francisco agreement, mm -hmm. and you are going to destroy the, this marriage relationship, right? right. So in a marriage, uh, people change. Whether it's an uh, arranged marriage, whether it's a you know, courtship or not, and people may have different background, but eventually they equalize as partners, yes. particularly nowadays. Uh, with women's lib and so on and so forth. You can't, I mean, say men dominate the world or the, the family and so on. No such things, right? So right. you have to show mutual respect. So in this G2 relationship, I just feel it's natural psychology for both government to realize now this is a partnership. If you want this partnership to work, you have to honor the commitments that historically and going forward. Yes, I think that uh, you're right uh, to say and uh, pay more attention 
to see the partnership or the relationship right. be put on an equal basis. Right. And I think that uh, in the past, uh, particularly uh, the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So at, there was a period of time that U.S. foreign policy mm -hmm. seemed to be the dominant role mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. because the uh, Soviet Union collapsed mm -hmm. and the bipolar become monopolar. Right. And uh, now whether the monopolar can, can dominate from that point on mm -hmm. is a different story. True. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, uh, even uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh mentioned about the world Mm -hmm. is no longer a bipolar or monopolar. Right, 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 right. Well, it is a multipolar right. situation. Oh, yeah. I, I think and many, many statesmen recognize that. A pluralistic uh, view mm -hmm. uh, would be a, a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that uh, we say that the, the rising of China mm -hmm. is not to say that China become a threat to the world peace, but at least we should recognize the importance of China's role in the world and uh, respect that he has a, a, a right of expressing mm. his point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And I the, think the, if we can respect each other mm. and put the partnership on a more equal basis, mm. then there will be less friction mm. uh, between the Sino-American relations. Right, right, right. I, I think this uh, uh, politician seeing things, uh, a good statesman that can see beyond the present sort of a, a phenomena or facts right. into the future is because they have some perception. I think, you know, unfortunately, sometimes uh, politicians do not see that far. Yeah. And, uh, you know, f for example, uh, as Kissinger and Nixon uh, went to China and so forth, uh, being in that contemporary pe period, and I, I sort of anticipate the relationship will develop a lot more uh, in a, in a um, positive, productive way. But it didn't, okay? Mm. I don't know, there's, a, you know, of course, many reasons, and uh, certainly uh, as, as uh, uh, our government changes sort of hand, uh, sometimes policies get, you know, uh, altered in some way. But now, let's say, um, compared to 70s, when our statesmen visit China, and they again see the current things, and then they come back, sort of develop this threat, insecure type of attitude. Again, I feel that's not a perceptive sort of a view that it is seeing into the future. I don't believe uh, just because you see a lot of highways being built Okay, a lot of you know manufacturing goods are being produced. That's going to translate to uh, threatening or you know some kind of a, 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 a military goal to attack anybody. This this connection is it's kind of a uh, not that you know direct. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, uh, for the past. Uh, uh, 20 years, the Chinese uh, economic growth is all monotonic <laughs> increase. Mm. And, uh, and by extrapolation, you will see an infinite power <laughs> right. China would that, develop. That certainly is, and uh, to that, some people, maybe scary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, remind me of uh, the uh, uh, 1970s and 80s uh, of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, that time, yeah. Japanese economy was very fast mm -hmm. and uh, was unquestionably the number two in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, however, uh, from that point on, from 1990s, yep. uh, Japan is on the way down. Yep. And because it didn't solve certain uh, inherent problems well, they have. You, you brought a good point. I think absolutely that's correct. But maybe this comparison actually made some people feel Japan, because they are small, limited population, mm. is aging and so forth, and China is still, you know, it's really growing mode, and lots of people, and bigger country, more resources. Maybe that's why they feel China is more, fee you know, sort of a threat than Japan, 
yeah. was in, in the, you know, in well, the city. Well, uh, I think that uh, China would not uh, uh, have the same kind of uh, uh, economic shortcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, or the weak strength mm -hmm. uh, as Japan, well, but it has different, its own different factors, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. its own problems. Right. Uh, for instance, uh, they're growing so fast that they didn't pay enough attention in the environmental protection. Mm -hmm. uh, they're growing so fast that uh, their uh, energy is in short supply, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the the rapid. Uh, investment mm -hmm. and reinvestment yeah. uh, into the system yeah. is now reaching a diminishing return. Yeah, I think the the fact that they are going uh, into a sort of consumption-based economy and talking to some people, of course, I don't have access to uh, real <clears throat> uh, official views, but I think people with you know knowledge or intelligence tells me that they correct this path they are smart enough to recognize this you know, continuous growth is not sustainable. And right. they realize that. They right. want to correct. And yeah. they just want stability. Right. So in, in such a way, you know, if you look at that you know, way, uh, I don't know why we should feel that China is a, a threat to the world. Correct. I think sometimes the, the, this, this fanning the you know, sort of flame uh, is, is causing that rather than, you know, yeah. China is really the, uh, you know, true Well, threat. I think that uh, from the... Uh